so nice to have Brother Tom joining us on the praise team today. Yes, God is good. So it's February. I wonder if you're feeling any closer to God in February than you were in January. Are we on the way? I know you're going, wait, wait, that was supposed to be at the end of the year, right? Okay, but we're already one-twelfth of the way there, right? And my hope is that, if nothing else, that your hearts begin to open up a little bit more to what God would do in you and through you. That Maybe you have learned um, the benefits of focusing on your faith a little more this year. So today we're going to start a new series. Uh, we're going to be going through the book of Ephesians. I love it when we go through a book together. I feel like God sets the agenda for us and that we get to be students of the word. And uh, instead of just talking about the things that feel important at the moment, we can talk about those eternal truths that God wants us to have. And so let me start this morning then with a little background on Ephesians for you. So if you want some time to turn there, you can. And I'll be reading from the New Living Translation as I usually do. So background-wise, we can just start by reading chapter, uh, verse 1. It says, This letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Jesus Christ. I'm writing to God's holy people in Ephesus who are faithful followers of Christ Jesus. Okay, so the book of Ephesians is a letter. Another word for that is an epistle. If you ever hear that word, epistle means letter, all right? And it was written by Paul. So in theology, we would call this a Pauline epistle, right? A letter of Paul. That seems simple enough, right? And, and Paul points out here that he's writing under God's authority because he was chosen by God to be an apostle of Jesus Christ. Do you remember that story? We won't go into it deeply, but... Paul was a unique person, and he was a Jew by birth, and he was well-educated in the law and all of those things, but he didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. And in fact, he thought it was a threat to the faith, and so he went around killing Christians until one day he encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus, the risen Jesus, and that changed everything. And Jesus said, I've chosen you. To be the apostle to the Gentiles. And that was kind of a crazy thing. Sometimes God does that, doesn't he? You're on one path and he goes, pick, pick, no, over here, right? And that's what happened to Paul. So Paul then becomes one of the fathers of the church in a sense because he has so much to teach the churches. And so he does that by writing letters. He did it by making visits, but by the time he wrote this letter... He was, uh, we think, probably around the year 62. And he was actually under house arrest um, in, by the Roman authorities there. And so Paul would, um, was not as free as he might have liked, but his ministry didn't stop there. He was uh, writing to the churches to encourage them, and especially to the Gentiles. Now, here's the funny thing about Ephesians. The words in that that said to the church at Ephesus weren't in the original text. So when they go back and they find early manuscripts, it didn't say that this was to Ephesus. So we call it Ephesians, but at some point that word wasn't even in there, right? And so what that means is that this letter is different because a lot of times Paul would write letters to a specific person or a specific church or a specific situation, Right? And so you can see from his letters that he's addressing something that's going on or someone that's ministering. But in the case of Ephesians, what happened is it was probably left blank who it was to when it was first written so that it could be sent out to multiple churches in the area. And it's possible that as they sent those out, they would write if, you know, which church it was going to at the time. And that's how we came to have some manuscripts that designated this as a, church, as a letter to the Ephesians. Does that make sense? Now, here's the cool part about that, because I know you're going, well, why is that even relevant? Because what it originally said was that this is a letter to God's saints and faithful followers. 
And to me, what that means is that the letter of Ephesians is actually a letter to us. It's a letter to faithful followers. You could just as easily erase the word of Ephesus, Ephesus there and say the church at Lebanon, right? You could take out Ephesians and make it generations. Because this is what Paul wanted to write to those who were in the church and who were faithful followers of Christ. And hopefully that includes you, right? So how cool is it then that Paul has written this letter to us? He begins with a greeting in verse 2. May God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. It's really easy just to skip right over that. But did you notice whose father he said? Our father. And how cool is it then that Paul is designating himself? The well, first, he's an apostle chosen by God. But the second thing is, he's a child of God. And so are you. And so his prayer is that our daddy God would give us grace and peace. And I think even that phrase just unites us as believers, that whether you are in Ephesus or in Rome or in Lebanon, he's still our father. And this is what binds us together as his family. So verse 3, then he goes on to say, All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. And so here's the cool part then. We're not just the only brothers and sisters, right? But he says Jesus is also our brother, and we are united together. What a powerful reminder that we are all his children. And so that we should praise him together as one big family. And he says in there, did you notice that he's praying for us to have spiritual blessings? And I think that word spiritual there is important because sometimes we come under the impression that if we are a part of the family of God, that we should have all of these blessings and a perfect life and no worries and all of the money that we need and, and the best car in the parking lot. That is a pretty sweet car, Charles. <laughs> <laughs> but okay but um anyway if y'all didn't see it and you got a new car you need to go look at it all right so, <laughs> but you know those are those are blessings but that's not spiritual blessings right what do spiritual blessings mean peace knowing that our soul is one with god eternal life in heaven these are the blessings that we share as the family of god not that our lives here on earth will be perfect but that we will be blessed from the very core of our souls as we walk with our family of God. And those are the things that are eternal and not the things that are temporary. So easy for us to look for blessings in this world and find all of the things that will mean nothing later on, right? The money in your bank account, the car that you drive, the clothes that you wear, even the things that you do for your own body will be of little consequence a hundred years from now. What will matter is the things that go on in your soul. And what will still be going on at that time is your relationship with God, our Father, and with each other as the family of God. I think it's important for us to remember that. It gives me strength and courage, too, to say, you know, I don't have to worry about the things here. I need to worry about the things here. And everything else will work out. Right? Paul goes on then to give us a picture of who we are as the family of God. So let me read the rest of this passage to you, starting with verse 4. He says, Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. 
This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. So we praise God for the glorious grace he has poured out on us, who belong to his dear son. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. He has showered his kindness on us along with all wisdom and understanding. God has now revealed to us his mysterious plan regarding Christ, a plan to fulfill his own good pleasure. And this is the plan. At the right time, he will bring everything together under the authority of Christ, everything in heaven and on earth. And furthermore, because we are united with Christ, we have received an inheritance from God. For he chose us in advance, and he makes everything work out according to his plan. God's purpose was that we Jews who were first to trust in Christ would bring praise and glory to God. And now you Gentiles have also heard the truth, the good news that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit, whom he promised long ago. The Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. And he did this so that we would praise and glorify him. Doesn't that just blow you away? Look at who we are. And this, this was what struck me as I was studying all of this, that, that God has had this plan from the very beginning. And when each of us looks at our lives, we kind of have a story, right? This is the story of my life, and you have a story of your life. But your story is supposed to be a part of God's plan. And it wasn't a plan that started when you got here on earth. Like he went, oh, there's Sandra. I should come up with a plan for her, right? No, it is a plan that he has had since before you were ever thought of by anyone here on earth. It was a plan he had for you from the very beginning. And this is the story of us, God's family, being written before we even read it on the pages. Even before God made the world, he already thought of us. <laughs> he chose us. He planned from the very beginning to one day send his son so that we could all become his family. Does that blow you away? I know we hear it so much in the church that maybe we take it from, for granted, right? God's sitting there creating the universe. I think, I think he'll put some stars in it, right? And at the same time that he's doing that, and he goes, oh, planets, planets would be cool, right? Oh, Violet, Violet would be awesome too, Joshua, I have a plan for Joshua that's going to blow him away. Do you see that at the same time God was creating the universe, he was thinking of you, and he had a plan for you. You were not an accident. You didn't come in under the radar without God realizing you were there. Oh, where'd that one come from? No. Before the planets even revolved around the sun. God already thought of us. And he knew that we would need a way to be in relationship with him. And so he had a plan. Jesus was not plan B. He was not an afterthought. Jesus was the plan. Jesus would be the way for God's creation to come back into relationship with him. I think that's really cool. God's goal was for Jesus to write our destiny with him. Now let me just address something here because sometimes people look at a passage like this and they use that word predestination, like God has already determined the outcome. But that's not what this means. 
what that means is that God has already chosen a plan for you. But you get to choose whether you're a part of that plan or not. And so while the destiny that he had in mind for you before you were even born lies there in wait, you get to choose whether you pursue that destiny or not. And I think he knows what your choice will be. But knowing and causing are not the same things, right? Because the truth is, he loves us enough not to make those choices for us. Maybe it is the greatest act of God to give his creation a free will. To have this great plan for each and every one of us and yet look at us and say, but I'm not going to force it on you. It's an act of love, isn't it? When Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden, I think God's plan was to walk with them and enjoy oneness with them to see them thrive in the garden that he created. And I think that that was his desire, that it brought him great pleasure to walk with them. But in the midst of his planning, I think he realized that forcing them to do so would not be the act of love that he wanted to commit. And so in the midst of the garden, he put a tree tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You see, his plan was not for them to know evil. But his love said, but they have to choose. They have to choose my way. Otherwise, they are just puppets. Otherwise, they're like dolls in a dollhouse that you can manipulate and make go however you want. And so out of his great love, he puts in the middle of the garden a tree and says, that's not my way. Don't choose it. But he gave them the ability to choose for themselves. I don't think God wanted us to be with him because we had to be. I think he wants to be with us when we want to be with him. And so the choices that they made meant that they had to be kicked out of the Garden of Eden. I don't think that was their destiny. It meant that they wouldn't live eternally here on earth, but that one day their bodies would, would come to an end and they would die because they made the choice that seemed too good to them at the time. And so exile became their story instead of God's plan. That's not the only time we saw that, right? God chose the Israelites to be his people. Do you remember that? I will be your God, and you will be my people. This will be great. And the whole world will see how amazing it is for us to be family by watching you. That was his plan for Israel. They didn't want his plan. They wanted their plan. They didn't stay with God's rules, even though they vowed to do it over and over again, right? They didn't want to be holy people. And so they chose disobedience. And as a people, they ended up in captivity. They ended up slaves in Egypt. Later on, they ended up being taken over by Babylon. I don't think that was God's destiny for them. I don't think when he created them, he said, this is going to be great. I'm going to make them become slaves. I think he said, this is my plan for them. And I love them. And I hope they walk in my plan. But when they didn't, they ended up in captivity. It wasn't God's plan but it was their story. Before any of it was set into motion, God already knew his people. and He knew that his creations would often make the wrong choice. And that includes us. And so God sent Jesus 
to be the way back. No longer would our people be defined by where we live in a garden or by where our blood is as Israelites, but instead our de definition as a people would come from putting our faith in Christ. And even then, he knew that we would need a way back to him. And so Jesus came and showed the greatest love ever demonstrated on this earth, that he was willing to die for us. And in doing so, he fulfilled God's plan so that from then on there would be a way, a way for his creation to come back to the Father. And still he gives us a choice. And when we make that choice, our story changes. Because you see, our, our story is not that different from Adam and Eve and the Israelites, right? Any of us who have chosen disobedience at some point in our life, and I'm pretty sure that's all of us, have a story. But that story wasn't necessarily God's plan he has a plan for you. And so he invites you to come into that story that he has for you. And when you do so, it produces an inheritance for us. We become co-heirs with Christ. All of those spiritual blessings become ours when we choose Jesus as a way of entering God's family. I think that's pretty amazing. Because I think God had this great plan for me from the very beginning. But man, oh man, I messed it up. Somewhere along the way, I developed this attitude that my plan was probably better for me than his. Somewhere along the way, I decided that the little things in my life that pulled me away from God seemed more important or more urgent at the time than what God would have me do. And yet in the midst of that, God looked at me and said, I still have a plan. And it's here for you. If you'll step into it. And the whole time I was writing this message, I kept thinking about this friends of mine, David and Charity, David and Charity used to live here in Tennessee, but um, he went into the military, and so they've traveled a lot. And they've had two great kids on their own. And they adopted a son from China, and his name is Everett. And they really felt like God laid it on their hearts to adopt Everett, to adopt a child, right? And so they prayed, and they raised money, and they sacrificed, and they went to China, and they got this baby. And the thing is, when they got Everett, he was what's called a blue baby, which means that his heart didn't work very well, and so he didn't get enough oxygen to his body. And so his extremities were blue. His life in China was there in an orphanage, no doubt abandoned because his parents had no way to care for a blue baby. And maybe they just didn't want to watch him die. And so for whatever reason, he ended up at an orphanage. And then for whatever reason, Everett ended up as a part of David and Charity's family. His story would have been very short if he had remained in China. Death was very certain. He was living there in poverty and isolation. But instead, he came to the U.S. where he received lots of love and great medical care. Surgeries and therapy and recovery. And today, Everett is a strong and healthy eight-year-old. And that's a great story, isn't it? And the story gets even better because now God has laid it on their hearts to adopt another child. They want to do it again, and they feel like God is calling them to do it again. In fact, he has provided for it. They've already covered the costs of adopting another child. 
And they've asked God to lead them to the right child. Possibly another blue baby. Certainly one with medical needs that can't be met by a family in China. So here's what struck me about all of this. They don't know who the baby is that they're going to adopt at this point. They don't know when that child is going to come into their family. Chances are it's already been born. But they are preparing for it. They are praying for that child. They're talking about that child. They post on their page, would you play, pray for our child today, whoever it might be. And I have this, this picture that they posted on the Internet and because this is um, a sign of their preparation. Amy, can you put that picture up? There we go. Thank you. This is Everett on the left, right, and Bentley on the right. And these boys will be this child's big brothers. And they have an older sister, Aspen, too. And they're carrying a mattress that was donated by people in their middle school for that baby. And so you see, they don't even know who it is yet. But they're preparing a place for it. They're already formulating a plan. This is where he or she will sleep. These are the doctors we have lined up as soon as we get custody. Aspen has been raising her babysitting money for over a year so that she can go to China with her parents to meet her sibling before they come back to the U.S. This child is already loved and cherished, even though they don't know who it is yet. Isn't that amazing? And I think that that child couldn't possibly imagine the life that waits for it here. A life where it can breathe. A life where it can grow. A life where it's doted on by siblings and parents and people who live in other states. I love this child already. And I don't even know who it is. But as I kept looking at their pictures and thinking about this child and the prayers they have, and right now they can't even go because of the coronavirus, you know, and that seems like a horrible thing, but do you think God knew? I think God knows exactly the day when this child will be placed in this family. And so they don't have to worry about it because they know God's in charge. This was God's plan. But God is changing the story of this child. Adoption is one of the most powerful things in the world because it changes someone's story. David and Charity have a plan for this child and a hope and a destiny, one that's so powerful and so great that a child living in an orphanage in China could not even fathom what that would be like. But this child will be chosen for a new life. This is her story. And it's being written already, even though she doesn't know it. I can't wait to see her face and to watch her grow into her new destiny. So many blessings yet to unfold. And the reason I think this story is so powerful is because it is our story too. Do you see? You see, we were all born impoverished spiritually. We were born at the beginning of a road that could go either way. And along the, along the way, we've made choices that would take us off of God's plan. You see? And, see? and in China, these babies are the ones nobody wants. Nobody wants them. Who wants that kind of problem? And if you're going to spend $30,000 adopting a child, do you want one that could come and die in the next year? No, you want the healthy child, right? Nobody wants these babies. And I'm just going to tell you, nobody wanted me. 
I think God looked at me and said, man, you really messed that up. And the rest of the world might have looked at me and went, yeah. But God didn't look at me that way. He looked at me and said, man, you really messed that up. But oh my, how I love you. And oh my, how I want to change your story and put you on my plan again and show you the destiny that I have for you. And so I will adopt you as my child. That's what God does for you. Is that your story this morning? It is God's will for you to be with him in heaven forever. Do you know that? How do you know that? He tells us in his word. Peter said it this way. The Lord's will is that none should perish. None. None. He didn't go handpick, I want these people over here. You know, I don't really want you guys, right? Because you messed it up so bad. No, no, no. He looks at every one of them and he's at one of us and says, my will is that you will not perish. You will not surely die. My will is for you to be in my plan, to be my child, and to come into my inheritance. God has an inheritance for you. And I don't care how bad you think you messed it up. I don't care how big a blue baby you are. God looks at you and says, you have so much worth and so much value to me. That for centuries, beyond centuries, I have made a plan for you to come and be in my family. Oh, that's his plan. And it's our story. He wants you to step into your story today. And how do you know if you're living the plan God has for you or not? It's not necessarily because everything is going perfect, right? How do you know? The Holy Spirit tells you. Did you hear that in verse 14? Let me, let me find it again. The Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised and that he purchased us to be his own people. The Spirit is his guarantee. We don't have to wonder if we are God's children. When this baby comes to live with David in charity, its name will be changed. It will have a new last name. And it won't ever have to wonder who it, has, who it belongs to. Everett doesn't have a question in the world about who his family is, right? And when you come to Christ, you don't have to wonder. When somebody says, are you going to go to heaven when you die? You don't have to say, oh, well, I hope so. No. The answer is yes. Yes. It is my inheritance and my destiny to go to heaven. Do you know why? Because God chose you. Not because you were worth it. Not because you got it all right. Not because you never thought your plan might be better, right? No, because he created you and he looked at you and said, you are precious to me. Are you going to heaven when you die? Yes. How do you know? The Holy Spirit tells me. And did you see? It says he gives us his spirit as a guarantee, a guarantee. Now that word, if you translate it, really looks more like our word for down payment. You know what a down payment is? It's the deposit of a little bit with a promise that more will come. And God has given us his spirit as a down payment. There's a little bit of spirit there, right? Which means... Do you ever have one of those moments when you really know the Holy Spirit is talking to you and working with you and you're like, this is the most awesome thing ever. It's just a little bit of what is yet to come. How do you know if the Spirit is in you? It shows in the way you live. The fruit of the Spirit is proof of His dwelling within you. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control, right? That is the evidence of the Holy Spirit. 
I go back to that peace one all the time. When you feel peace and you know you shouldn't, that's the Holy Spirit. And my friends, this inheritance is richer than anything we could ever imagine because even now we're still living impoverished like children in an orphanage in China, but our inheritance is yet to come, right? Oh, we may have been plucked out of that orphanage and come into a family, but it's going to get even better. He has things for you, spiritual blessings for you that you cannot even imagine. You just have to take your place in his family. Let him be your father. Co-heirs with Christ. As we continue through the book of Ephesians in the weeks ahead and months ahead, Paul is going to write more and more about what it means to live as a member of this family. And every time we see the word and we encounter what it says, my hope is that we're looking at it and going, is this, is this how I'm living? Am I living like a child of the king? And if not, do I need to step back on his plan? But in order for us to do that, we have to really believe that his plan is better than ours. And that his destiny is for us is better than anything we could shape or imagine ourselves. I want his plan to be your story. I want you to know that wherever you are right now, the rest of your story is not done. That you have a choice. Why do you have a choice? Because he loves you enough not to force you. To be with him. But why would you choose. To stay an orphan. When you could step into the riches. Of God's family. I'm going to ask our band. If they'll come on back up. As we prepare for a time of worship. And if you feel that. If you are so thankful for where you are this morning. That you are a part of his family. Then my encouragement to you is to praise him. He did this so we would praise and glorify him. That is our response to a God who has saved us. To praise and glorify him. But if you've been feeling lost. Or abandoned or trying to write your own story, then I invite you to make a new chapter today. To take different steps right now. Because it would give him great pleasure for you to call him father. He loves you already. And he waits to bless you. If you'll come to him. Would you stand as we pray? Father God, we love you so much. And we thank you that, that even in Paul's life, God, that you changed his story so drastically. But all along, you had this plan for him, and you brought him back to where he needed to be. And God, we acknowledge that there are times when we step off of your plan, times when we have missed it, times when we have been selfish, times when we have gone after temporal blessings instead of the eternal. And so we humbly come before you, God, asking for your forgiveness and just feeling so grateful that even if we look insignificant or unwanted to the rest of the world, you look at us with eyes full of love as a father who says jump into my arms my child so help us to respond to you today to step into your destiny for each one of us for our families for our church that we might dwell with you in richness forever in Jesus' name, we pray. Amen.